So a lot of what you're talking about, Roy, is, uh, is self-defense and uh, um, kind of a mixed martial arts types of training. In jiu-jitsu, we have also the sports side. There's mm -hmm. guys that that would have no interest in a lot of the things that are being taught. They have they live in maybe a safe city like Irvine, mm -hmm. and uh, they have no um, worries about um, defending themselves in the street, but they want a healthy, active sport to, to mm -hmm. train. And um, do you think there's a place for those types of people that want to train jiu-jitsu as a sport, much like judo is a sport nowadays? Oh yes, definitely. Uh, to me, martial arts, uh, saying the words martial arts is nondescript. It's like saying vehicle. Um, within the martial arts, you have traditional styles, eclectic, holistic, combative, and sportive. Um, and so there's a lot within martial arts for everybody. Everything doesn't have to be about the street fight or the UFC. Everything doesn't have to be about the tournament. There's a lot within each art and each style to meet a variety of different needs. So for the people who are only into it for camaraderie, brotherhood, uh, an activity to do rather than just going to a gym, I think that's great. For the people who love the tournament, I think that's great as well. But to say one is better than the other, it's like saying which food is the best. You know, it's personal choice and it's what an individual wants. So yeah, I think there's, um, more than enough uh, in martial arts for, uh, or in jiu-jitsu, uh, for people to pick and choose what they like and what they don't like. Very wise words. So Roy, you've been in the, the martial arts business for a long time, and I'm curious what holds your interest now? Are you interested in, uh, in going to tournaments and competing or opening up uh, more franchise academies, or w what excites you these days? couple of things uh, and they're both related teaching and mentoring um, I love teaching because I love uh, watching students grow and mature and when I say mature uh, immaturity is a self-centeredness that says it's all about me um, and maturity is about becoming a part of a community and reaching a certain level where you actually start to give back to the community and then reaching another level where that's all you want to do is give 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 and so i enjoy teaching and helping people to mature uh, both as human beings as well as practitioners within the art um, because being a practitioner within the art i think it's important to have longevity um, it's one thing to be a a 20-year-old world champion uh, and to be a phenom and to be a, a, a specimen but when those days are done and you finish your college degree and you start going to work and you get your first promotion and then she comes along and then wah, wah, that baby comes along and you get that promotion to director or vice president um, I've seen a lot of guys go from the six-pack to the one-pack and um, priorities take over and so um, athleticism I think is short-lived but having a good sense of technique a good sense of positioning a good sense of timing is good for the long run so that you can practice and train jiu-jitsu into your 50s 60s 70s and even your 80s Some very wise words and uh, I, I hear what you're saying I, I struggle with that as as part of our company, Buddha Videos. How do you showcase guys, much like yourselves, who are amazingly talented teachers, when the world champions kind of, uh, their shadow is, uh, is pretty big, you know? That's what people see on the covers of magazines and winning tournaments and all that. But it's not always the case that they're the best instructors. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. <clears throat> the old expression that says, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach, um, while there is some truth to that, I don't necessarily believe that way um, because not only from personal experience but from hearing a lot of people, uh, some of these world champions are horrible instructors because they don't know how to teach and they don't understand presentation, they don't understand how people learn, they don't understand giving people value for the money that they, that they spend to attend seminars or to attend an academy. And so I think in today's age, now that there is, uh, there are so many resources like DVDs and YouTube and uh, apps, 
Um, I think it's real important for people to learn how to teach. And that's one of the reasons why I started doing instructor courses, to teach people that, you know, the easy part of teaching is just showing and demonstrating technique. The hard part is uh, helping students learn, helping students grow, giving them value for what they're investing as far as their time and their money, um, and then showing them how to make happy, satisfied clients. Because it's a business. You're a businessman first and a martial art instructor second. Mm. Um, and so uh, just because a person is a phenomenal practitioner of the art, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have good technique. I look at some of these world champions on YouTube and I see technically, on a scale of one to 10, I would give them a six or a seven. Physically, as far as what they can actually do with their body, they're phenomenal athletes. The things that they can do with their, with their body is awesome. And that's why they win. And so you've got this balance between athleticism and the technique, the art. Um, and some people know that very well and can take it from the gray matter and put it out the tongue. Um, others cannot. Mm -hmm. And then there are some who don't necessarily possess those skills, but they've taken time to know and understand and be able to explain to others so that they can understand and retain what's being taught. Um, those people aren't necessarily pushed to the forefront by the magazines um, and by the, by the news media in general. Um, so uh, here are my thoughts on this. I think it's only a matter of time before people see that there's a difference between the 20 and 30 year old and the 40 and 50 year old, mm -hmm. which is the reason why I started the whole BJJ over 40 thing back in the early 2000s, because I had an inbox full of guys in their 40s and the 50s that were tired of getting injured and they wanted something different. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said about physical skills, but um, eventually those physical skills are going to uh, go down a bit and a person's going to take on the role of instructor or coach. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think it's important to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk, um, but equally important being able to help that 14-year-old, 98-pound uh, boy or girl that's struggling with self-confidence to give them confidence and to give them uh, something that they can actually use to defend themselves, to prevent being bullied, um, that has so much more value than trophies and medals, Yeah, at least I think. And a lot of times the students aren't able to do what these world champions can do mm -hmm. because of their lack of extreme athleticism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm curious what uh, changes uh, you've done with your jiu-jitsu over the past 10 years, you know, due to refinements or, or due to age. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a, as I took a look at my training, um, and I do this every year, year and a half. I step back and take a look at what I've done and the progression goes from effectiveness to efficiency to playfulness. Everybody in martial arts wants to be effective with whatever it is they're learning. Um, and that's a good goal, but it's an elementary goal. It's very simple. Um, and here's the thing about effectiveness. You don't need techniques or even martial arts training to be effective. I say this at my seminars all the time. You want to be effective in martial arts? Go to a local pub or nightclub um, and get into a fight every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. In two years, you'll be tough. Mm -hmm. You'll probably have an arrest record. You'll probably have some missing teeth and some broken ribs, but you'll be tough. And so martial arts training is not, uh, I don't think the focus should eventually be just effectiveness. I think it needs to evolve to being efficient, meaning you accomplish the same goals, a kick, a punch, a throw, an arm lock, a choke, um, but you do it with less effort, less energy. Um, and then finally, the ultimate level is to be playful, is to have uh, super clean technique, 
phenomenal timing and awareness and slow down your game and spar with somebody half your age who's twice as strong as you are and has three times your endurance and tire them out through positioning and timing. So this is what I have done with my game. I have tried to make my movements and my positioning, which are the precursors to good technique. I have honed them to uh, a very high level, uh, a level I call the geek nerd level. Um, and so that's what I have done with my Jiu Jitsu and with my martial arts. To me, it's not about studying another style or learning more techniques. It's about um, taking the two or three handful of techniques that I already know and polishing them to a high level so that um, the people that I spar with that are young enough to be my son and uh, who are much stronger and have much more endurance than me and to play with them, toy with them, and then either shake their hand and give them a hug or to have a little bit of an attitude, maybe finish with uh, a wrist lock or uh, an arm lock. Um, so my focus uh, over the last 10 years has been to be more efficient and more smooth and to uh, simplify what I'm doing. I don't see how anybody could argue with that. It sounds like uh, what we should all be striving for. So one of your um, most popular students, anyway, is, is Roy Dean. Um, have any, any memories of, of training with him over the years? Yes, uh, Mr. Dean came, for me, uh, came to me. Uh, he was a student at uh, UCSD. And uh, he came to my jiu-jitsu class at the, at the university there and started to train with me at my academy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and uh, I have a lot of good memories of him, not only as a practitioner, but as a human being. He and his good friend, uh, Brad Hirakara, started a very respectful um, culture at my academy. I've always been kind of laid back and easygoing, and the whole bowing and sir, sifu, sensei, guru, all that, I've never really been into that. But because of his back down, background, he kind of, he did that all the time and started mandating that other students do it. I remember uh, one particular class, I'm not sure if it was uh, Mr. Dean or Mr. Harakara, but um, there was a new guy there and I was on one end of the mat um, working with somebody and this guy was kind of in the middle of the mat and Mr. Dean and uh, Brad Harakara were on the other end of the mat and the guy, he says, hey, you, he yelled really loud, hey, you. And that was to get my attention. And he wanted to ask me a question about something. Oh, Roy Dean and Brad Hirakara were livid. Like, you do not call <laughs> Mr. Harris, uh, uh, hey, you. Um, so plus, for many years, they were my filming buddies. You look in a lot of my old uh, videos, you see uh, Roy Dean there and Brad Hirakara. And so, yeah, I have a lot of uh, really good memories of, uh, of him. Or as a great uh, teacher in his own right. Yes. So what is uh, in the future for you? Uh, any new uh, instructionals coming up? Yes. I, uh, as you know, in 2010, I sold my academy and started to focus on uh, seminars and apps. And uh, now I find myself getting tired of airplanes and airports and cranky flight attendants and all of that. So I'm going to actually place more eggs in the basket of uh, books, both digital and print, and also uh, apps, iOS, and this spring I'll actually start to go to the Android platform as well. Nice. Any new uh, titles you can give us? Yes. One of the new ones that's coming out in late February, early March is called Guard Passing Simplified. Remember I talked about... Uh, how I like to simplify things. Mm -hmm. um, while I have developed this process for passing the guard, doesn't matter what guard it is, passing the guard, it's a six step process. Um, but instead of the focus being on the technique, the focus is on how do you train it? You know, technique only takes a person so far. How a person actually trains determines what kind of skill sets they actually develop. And so the focus of this app will be, how do you train to pass the guard? 
and I'm starting there because it's a uh, it's a, a, a personal favorite area of mine. I'm somewhat old school, and then I prefer to I like the top game. Um, I can do the bottom game, but I prefer the top game. And you know, one of my nicknames is Boa, and I got that because of all the pressure that I put on people. And uh, a part of my A game is uh, involves passing the guard. So first, I got to put them on their butt and force them to do guard. Then I do a simplistic form of guard passing. Doesn't matter the guard. Um, and then I go to the side and put a lot of pressure, either <coughs> on the chest or on the neck or on the uh, um, on the elbows to get a person to move their arms where I want them to move them and to finally finish with some type of arm lock or choke. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at jujitsu in comparison with other grappling methods, uh, other grappling methods, you see that what separates jujitsu from all the other arts is the guard. So if a person wants to know how to really fight against jujitsu, you gotta pass the guard, you gotta deal with the guard. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a, a very fundamental area uh, for those who are those who love the top game and those who kind of want a shortcut to the process of dealing with uh, jiu-jitsu practitioners like the you know sambo doesn't really have a guard judo doesn't really have a guard wrestling doesn't have a guard um, but how do you get past those legs mm -hmm. and so uh, this is going to be a, a cornerstone for the top game. That sounds nice, and that's an area that I think is a little neglected nowadays. You know, with the, with the double guard pulls, people feel like uh, they both have a good guard, and they're not going to bother trying to pass. They'll just try to sweep underneath and get, mm -hmm. you, get to your back. So I mm -hmm. think that's nice that you're working on that. We're looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, should we go on to the technique portion? Sure. All right. So Roy, the technique portion is one of my favorite segments of the show. This is where um, well-known instructors share some of their most valuable uh, techniques. What would you like to show today? Um, today I'd like to show you about the importance and the value of positioning. Um, when people talk about the positions, many people think about the mount, the side mount, the guard. Uh, those are all positions, but those are the major positions. In my nerdy geek mode, I've also developed minor control positions, as well as a subject called positioning, learning how to position yourself to take leverage away from your opponent in an inferior position. Um, for example, put me in your guard place. With the basic under the leg guard pass, as you grab a hold of the lapel, I'm gonna have you take your right elbow and put it on the front of the hip on the inside of the iliac crest there and you're going to put weight down on it and you're also going to contract your abs and push down you feel how heavy that so you're is moving your hips back just a little yes. bit mm -hmm. then my left hand goes behind my back and there's a little v little triangle between your uh, feet and my back i'm going to put my hand there reach back and uncross your ankles. At this point in time, many people feel as though they are vulnerable for the triangle, but with pressure down, they're not. As long as I keep the weight down, pushing down into the mat, I'm good. The left hand will grab a hold of the lapel, um, very deep, and from here, most everybody wants to either pull this arm free or raise their hips up. And when they do, the second thing is you're going to drive forward and sprawl and put all of the body weight onto your right butt cheek. Right now, on a scale of one to 10, how much pressure is on your right side? Maybe a four. Yes. Come up, and then I sprawl. What's the number now? Now it's a 9.5. What's the pressure on your neck? That's a 10. Yes. This is how I pass the guard. No movement to the left. All going straight forward. Let's do this one more time from this side, please. So first, the position with my right arm. Left hand goes into position. I arch my back, pull all of my weight down so that the pressure goes onto your uh, left hip and prevents, move your, your hips please. 
makes it very hard for you to move your hips. I reach underneath, grab a hold of the lapel, and I want to grab with my thumb down. And as you try and pull my arm free and raise your hips, I will drive forward and put all of my weight onto your right butt cheek. <clears throat> Feel the love on your neck? Yeah. Yes, lots of love there. I drive forward, raise my head up, and then <clears throat> use my left bicep and pec to push your legs to the side and then pass. This is my favorite way of passing the guard. Yeah, you probably moved a total of about three inches. Yes. <laughs> Rory, there'll be people watching this and say, well, that's easy for you because you're a big, strong guy. Mm -hmm. What's your answer to that? I say, this is something you really have to feel to appreciate. And over the years, I've had people actually say that. Students at seminars, even some of my instructors. Um, Last six months to a year, I've really made an effort to help people to understand that my game is truly built on leverage, not my size. Let me show you. Can I have you on your back, please? When you push, one of the strong areas of pushing are the heel of the hand at the base of the thumb at the base of the uh, pinky. My thumb against the heel of your hand, I push and my thumb, nothing. But let's turn a little bit sideways here. When I change that pushing point one inch to the left and I go on the outside of your wrist, it's very weak. So when, we'll just use this arm, when people push on my chest as I pass the guard, the platform that they're pushing on is my chest. When I turn, just 45 degrees. Keep pushing, please. There, that's good. I turn 45 degrees and collapse your arm. Wow. You just made me change from feeling so strong and secure to feel like the structure is just gone. Mm -hmm. Here's another point. Uh, right here on the ulna, where the ulna meets the humerus, this is a very strong point. Let's go on this side. Especially with the top arm. I push into you, feels really strong. Mm -hmm. I take this contact point and I go from here up to here. Push, please. <clears throat> or underneath. So when you put your arms in posture, that's good as long as I continue to push in that same direction. But when I change directions, mm -hmm. again. So knowing where to place your weight is paramount to developing a game that is truly built on leverage not athleticism. And so uh, let me show you one more thing in relation to this, and this is something that I show to my BJJ over 40 instructors. I call this treachery. So please on your side. It's called treachery because do you see how little energy I was actually using to collapse your arms? Mm-hmm, absolutely. What I've taught my instructors in the 40s and 50s to do is to use treachery to wear out the young gun. So as you push to place me back in the guard, I... Keep going, Chris. I know exactly where to put my weight to counter all your pushing, but audially I give you something that feels like you're this close to getting something on me, mm. and I want you to try harder. That's a good point. That reminds me when Boss Rutten talked about when you're in a choke and you're not even being choked to just gurgle and make those sounds that the guy tries harder and harder and yes. wears himself out, same idea. Yeah. So, like we talked about earlier, trying to move from being effective to being efficient to eventually being playful. Mm -hmm. Fun stuff. And yeah, I can really feel that you are a big, strong guy and you can use your weight and, and you should, but uh, the things that you're doing didn't require a lot of a force. So I, mm -hmm. I do think smaller guys can do that as well. Yes. And it's a little difficult to see on, on camera, but I wish you could feel it. 
huh? Because that is something to, to feel. Yes. One more thing. Yes. Um, as jujitsu is evolving, um, a lot a certain things are happening that I think are good, but I think it's important that uh, we as practitioners, we as instructors, we as black belts change with it. You know, one of the most common arm lock escapes now is the hitchhiker escape. And I see it used over and over again, and it's a great escape. Um, but now in my basic classes, I no longer teach people to put their thumb in the old position. I put their thumb in a new position. And it, the hitchhiker escape. Please, on your back. So the old way, pulling back, hugging, and putting the thumb up allows you, yes. Very efficient escape. No more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, can't I don't put even my need my up. leg over your face. Go ahead, hitchhiker escape. Nope, it's not gonna happen. Go ahead and sit up. That's not gonna happen either. Yes. So, when a person sits back, they hug. And as they hug, their form is gonna slide down and grab the hand, the old Aikido days. And as you grab the hand, you turn the thumb down. And with the thumb turned turn down, one side of the bicep turns off and the arm weakens. And your ability to turn away from me nope. is very limited. And then all I have to do is keep this left leg over your face or the right knee into your chest. Wow. Yeah, you are, there's no way. I'm gonna hitchhike escape out of that position. Yes. And you're probably not teaching escape to that either, are you? Uh, well, yes I am. Here's the thing though. Uh, I teach the arm lock escapes in series. The first series is uh, twist the arm. Second series is tuck the arm. Third series is throw the legs and sit up. Uh, fourth series is to throw the legs and roll over your shoulder. So there's a whole series. Um, and so hitchhiker escape is a great escape, but it's only one technique in a series of turning this way. You have to have another series that turns this way have to have another series for this, and have to have an entirely new series when the arm gets fully extended. Yes. yes. You have to act, act quick. Yes. <laughs> wow. Roy, thank you so much for coming on. Sure, today. thank you. I learned a lot from you, you know, not just today, but over the years. So thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge. And I think you're a good role model for the people that want to roll their whole lives. And I think that's great. Thank you. Where can people find out more about you online? RoyHarris.com. That's my main website. Yes. That's simple. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yes. And thank you guys for watching this week in BJJ.